Uh, so I'm coming from uh, an institute uh, close to Sciences Po called OFCE, Observatoire Français des Conjonctures Économiques, so the French Observatory for Business Cycle, something like this. And uh, we are involved for some years, seven years, in, in a project with some colleagues from Denmark, from Germany, and from Austria, on what we have called the IAGS, the Independent Annual Growth Survey. And I wish to present you our latest report today, so I will try to make it as brief as possible, because if I have still some, some time left, I would like to show what we have done in the past with this project using a macro model. Okay, so I will start with some gray report, and then turn back, uh, turn to, to things that are more, uh, uh, more quantitative. The, the point of departure is the following. Seven years ago, I have been in touch with someone at the European Parliament who was or is still working for the socialist and democrat groups at the European Parliament, who told me the following story. Seven years ago, in this group, but in all other groups of the European Parliament, they had no information related to economics except what the Commission would give them. Which meant that by the end of the year, the Commission would give some recommendation, recommendations to the different member states of the Eurozone or the European Union without the different groups at the European Parliament being able to understand what it was all about, if it were the good recommendations or not. Okay? So the question he asked was, would you be willing to do some work in order for us to have another report that would, to some extent, compete with the Commission's view about the Eurozone and about the different member states? We started discussion at the OFCE, and we considered that was a good opportunity to deal with European issues with a group of other institutes. So the other institutes that have been involved for these, for so, so many years, are the IMK in Germany, Düsseldorf in Berlin, was the ECLM, who is um, a research center related to trade unions in Denmark, and finally, four years ago, the AK, uh, uh, an institute in Austria, in Vienna, who is also related to trade unions. And our goal has been to produce a competing annual growth survey as regards that of the Commission. Okay. And we call it independent because we do not uh, obey any orders. These are not the orders of the Commission. This is not the orders of the government. It is even no orders from the SND group, who is partly funding our research, but not intervening in our research. Okay, so we produce this for, for years. And the latest report I will deal with in a minute. We called it Repair the Roof When the Sun is Shining. Okay. This has been a very fashionable title. Unfortunately, we didn't see, when we released the report, that Christine Lagarde first used it in last September. In Harvard, she made a speech that she called, we should be repairing the roof when the sun is shining, quoting John Fitzgerald Kennedy, as we did. But this was only a speech that you can find on the internet. Then comes our report that gives some information on the diagnosis that we may have on the Eurozone and on the different solutions to the shortcomings with the management of the Eurozone. Finally, the day after we presented the report in Brussels, there was a paper by Martin Wolf in the Financial Times that used the same title but didn't mention us. And finally, the president of the Commission, Juncker, used the same title a few days ago in January without mentioning us, but he stole the title. Okay, so 
he made a speech, we should be repairing the roof when the sun is shining. So it seems there is a large convergence among the IMF, the Financial Times, the European Commission, and the group of institutes that I represent today on the diagnosis. Okay? It seems that the situation in the euro area has improved. We may not converge on the solutions to the crisis. We did not reach a convergence before and during the crisis. During the crisis. And nowadays, we do not share the same views as the Commission as regards the way to escape the next crisis or to be sure to have enough growth to be uh, able to have a GDP above its pre-crisis level. So my outline for the presentation of the report will be to give you some information on the situation in the euro area and then deal with a few reforms that we propose in this report. One is related to fiscal policy, the second to uh, dealing with macro imbalances and the risks that are very strong about the current macro imbalances in the euro area and a solution as regards monetary policy to improve its possible effectiveness. Okay. So, yes, you, you can interrupt me if you have questions. So uh, maybe it's not the deal, but if you have any questions that are urgent uh, questions, do not hesitate to ask. And you'll be having some time after to, to ask questions. So this first graph gives us the evolution of the GDP, the gross domestic product in real terms, in the Eurozone, and also the contributions of some of the major uh, member states to this growth. So the first information on this slide and graph is first that in comparison with the early 2016, GDP has been recovering in the Eurozone. This is something we all know about. It's in the, in the data. What is maybe less known is the fact that this improvement in growth has been better evenly distributed between the different member states. Okay? If you look at the contribution of Germany to uh, this growth in the euro area, it's always 0.5. Okay, 0.5 or 0.6. Okay. It was the case when growth was starting resuming in the early 2016. It is still the case in the uh, second quarter of 2017, 0.6. What has been changing is the contribution of France, which has been increasing. The contribution of the Netherlands that has been increasing and the contribution of the smaller member states of the euro area, which has been increasing. So the good news here is that growth is back and for a large group of countries. It's not only Germany, it's all the member states, okay. except one, Italy, which contribution to the eurozone is still relatively weak or very weak. If we look into more details to the different growth rates of the different member states, we can see that the situation of Italy is relatively bad as regards the sharp crisis from which we all come. Okay. So since the GDP has been declining strongly in 2009 and in 2011, 2012, we should all be having growth. Okay, This would be part of the recovery. But this is not what's happening in Italy, which is still having a low growth rate as regards the Eurozone average or as regards comparative countries like maybe France. Okay? So Italy is suffering from a lack of growth as regards the other member states. What is also Certainly interesting with these data is the situation of the UK, Great Britain here, GBR, which, whose growth is below now the Eurozone average. Okay, so it seems that we can see in the data the beginning of the possible costs with the Brexit. Okay. 
So this is certainly good news for the Eurozone, but maybe not sufficient good news in the Eurozone not to think about reforming the Euro area. Okay, the sun is shining, but certainly we need some reforms. Okay, but growth is resuming, and evenly so. If we look at some other macro variables, like inflation, you can see on this slide the still large discrepancy in inflation rates across the different member states of the European Union and across the different member states of the Euro area. So the interesting news is that inflation is going faster in Germany than the Euro area average, which might decrease to some extent its very, very large trade surplus. So that might help Germany converge to some extent to the average Euro area. But if you look at Italy or France, you can see that we're looking for inflation. Okay? Inflation in these two countries and in some other countries on the right hand side of the the bar in red, are below the average. Okay? So we are looking for inflation, which will be a very strong case in favor of our reforms for fiscal policies. And the problem that we can see in this data is that the inflation rate for the euro area is very far from the target that the ECB has given itself. Okay? You certainly know that in, 90, in the early 90s, in the Maastricht Treaty, the ECB, that was not born yet, was given a primary objective of price stability, but the treaty didn't say what price stability would be meaning in the end. It's the central bank, the European Central Bank, that has decided upon the exact definition of price stability, which means that this central bank is very peculiar in the world because it has an independence of means, like many other central banks in the world, but to some extent it has had some independence in its objective. It might have well decided that the inflation target would not be below 2%, but below 3% are a range between 1% and 3% per year in the mid-run if they wish. Okay? So they decided upon that target. Okay? And if we look at the data, we may well say, okay, they've not been successful. Because they didn't hit their inflation targets for years. And maybe the requirement for some reforms. But you certainly also know that this central bank is very independent from the political power, which means that many, many institutions, governments, the Commission, but sometimes as well the 14 economists from France and Germany that have proposed so many reforms but are very close to the power in their own countries, they do not wish to propose anything related to monetary policy and the change in the statutes of the central bank. Okay. But we're not part of them. We're labeling ourselves independent, which I think we are, which I hope you will think we are. So we argue that we may be changing the statutes of the ECB. There have been so many changes in the world and so many changes in the policies that the ECB is being implementing that maybe we should be thinking about okay, changing the statutes why only a price stability objective? Why not another type of objective, more real terms related, like a growth objective? Why not putting it clearly that this central bank must produce financial stability? Okay. We are having a banking union without having changing the treaty. So we don't know if this will be for years or if it will be changed this banking union. Does it mean a change in the statutes or not? 
question mark. Okay, so at this stage, we're lacking inflation, and there are many discussions that you certainly know about secular stagnation, and so on and so forth. Next thing uh, about the diagnosis, the imbalances. Okay. On this graph, the IAGS team, mostly in Paris, has computed a misadjustment indicator between the different member states in the euro area. It is computed the following way. We are looking for the change in prices of value added in each member state of the Eurozone that would permit to limit at zero the output gap, so have the GDP go back to the potential, and we compute this same change in value added prices so that trade imbalances vanish. But we are introducing a symmetrical view about trade imbalances. We are not only computing the price decline in countries that have a trade deficit, but also the price increase in countries with a surplus, a trade surplus. So we take for granted that all the member states should abide by the macro imbalance procedure and that the Commission would make it possible for all these countries to fulfill this macro imbalance procedure. There are different indicators in this MIP. The first one is to limit trade surpluses to six percentage points of domestic GDP and to limit trade deficits to four percentage points of domestic GDP. Okay. So this is, to some extent, asymmetric. You can have a higher trade surplus than you may be having a trade deficit, but you should be limiting your trade surplus Have you had one above 6%. And you must also limit your external debt, your net investment international position, to minus 35%. So we have computed the price change in a country like Greece that would have its net international investment position, its past deficits, back to minus 35%. But we also have computed the price change in Germany so that the trade surplus would be below 6 percentage points of GDP and the output gap be zero. Okay. So we compute these prices and we make a computation of their standard deviation and we introduce GDP weights to our Eurozone misadjustment index. And finally, you, we are able to compute the contribution of all the member states individually to the overall misadjustment in the euro area as regards the rest of the world. Okay, so this is what you are looking at for some minutes now. What this misadjustment indicator is telling us is that the worst imbalances that we have been having as regards trade and the output gap was in 2007. Since then, the misadjustment of the euro area has been declining. Okay. Smoothly at the beginning, sharply at the end, so that in 2016, the evolution of prices that we are having is not that far from what we should be having regarding the computations that we've been making. Okay. So, misadjustment has been declining. The situation has improved as regards macro imbalances. The second point that this graph is telling, telling us is that the country in 2007 that was the main culprit in macro imbalances in the euro area was Greece. 
Okay? The purple uh, bar, part of the bar. Okay? It was astounding. Their prices were very, very far from the prices they, sh they should have been having in order to limit their external debt and to have their GDP come back to the potential. They had positive output gaps, they should have been declining prices, and they, have, they were having large current account imbalances, hence a requirement to reduce prices. But as you can see, their contribution to misadjustment has declined to almost zero today. Okay? So changed, things have changed substantially in this country, Greece. Hence, participating in the improvement of the Eurozone situation vis-à-vis -vis the rest of the world. But if you look at the situation in 2016, half of the misadjustment is coming from Germany. So the situation of current account imbalances remains not because of deficits now, but because of surpluses. And now the main culprit is Germany. So Greece has made its way towards rebalancing. Germany needs to do. And then, what about the situation on the labor market? I was, maybe I can sum up what I've been telling until now. Recovery is here. It is relatively even, but there are still remaining sharp problems, like the lack of inflation, like imbalances that remain in surplus countries, and also relatively large unemployment rates. So unemployment rates have been improving since 2012, okay. but the situation of those without a degree is worse than the situation of the average on the unemployment rate. I'm commenting upon the, uh, the, 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 the bottom uh, graph. So the distinction between the green evolution of the unemployment rate and the blue evolution of the unemployment rate. So on average, you have a decline of the unemployment rate for all levels of education with a relatively low unemployment rate, but it's very and sharply higher if you have a relatively low level of education, uh, level one to two. And there is also a remaining large problem within the euro area, which is the discrepancy between the different member states. If you look at the, the graph on top, you can see that the unemployment rate of the large Western countries has almost not changed before and after the crisis, if we can tell that we are after the crisis, mainly thanks to Germany. So the unemployment rate has increased in France, but since it declined in Germany during the crisis, on average, it has been almost steady. In the eastern part of Europe, the unemployment rate has increased, then decreased, to come to the levels in the Western Europe. But the situation is not at all the same in the so-called periphery, the Southern Europe, which has had a very strong and sharp increase in the unemployment rate, an improvement since 2013, but still very high unemployment rates, which means that for these countries, sharing the same currency as the Western part of Europe, maybe at some cost. Okay. So we need some instruments to deal with this lack of convergence of new or new divergence. Okay. Solutions. So these are the solutions that we're discussing in the latest report. But since it's the fixed that we're doing, they were solutions in the five former reports. Some are the same, some are extensions of the former reforms. This reform is something that we were proposing one year ago that we've decided to recommend once again uh, last November, which is the adoption of the golden rule of public finance. Okay. So 
What is it? The golden rule of public finance. It's a fiscal rule by which public investment could be, to some extent, freely funded out of debt. Hence, the fiscal target would comprise all spending except public investment minus all tax receipts and non-tax receipts. Which means that if ever we were having a golden rule of public finance, we would be able to face two, in our view, positive situations. The first one would be that during crisis, the governments would not use public investment to reduce deficits. The first reaction of governments, once they are being hit by a crisis, that they see that social spending is soaring, but they must meet and fulfill a fiscal rule, is to cut public investment. They did so in the early 90s, the former recession, and they did so in 2009, the sharp crisis. They did it as well in 2012. They cut public investment. But the reason is very easy. It's a political economy argument. The citizens, usually they do not know that public investments were planned. Since they didn't know, if you cut something that you didn't know would happen, you don't know that there is a cut. But if it was planned, it was in the law of finance. If you cut it, you improve your situation. You reduce your deficit, you improve your public finances. So this has happened many times, and because it happened, Juncker at the Commission decided upon a plan, the Juncker plan, in order to increase public investment. He decided to do so in 2014. It was starting being implemented in 2015. Okay? But out of 20 billion euros. Okay. 20 billion euros, it's nothing. Okay. For us, it's a large amount of money. We could be able to do many things if we were having 20 billion euros, certainly. But for the European Union at 28, it's nothing. Okay. To have things clear, the GDP in France every year is above 2,000 billion euros for France. And I was speaking about 20 billion euros for 28 nations. So we were thinking, Juncker was thinking, thinking that out of 20 billion euros, he would be able to improve public investment all over the European Union at 28. Okay. It's, and he said that with these 20 billion, we would be making 500 billion euros more, okay. which maybe will be happening, but that will just make sure that what we would have been having in terms of public investment without the crisis, we will finally be having it. But without the crisis, the level of public investment would have been large, largely higher. Okay, so we lost ground and we thought about trying to have a public investment policy without the means. So our requirement is to have this kind of policy in favor of public investment at the level of the states, and all countries will be having a golden rule of public finance. The reason why we consider it would be worthwhile to have such a rule is deals with using the different arguments of macroeconomists about the secular stagnation. There are at least two views about secular stagnation. So the secular stagnation has its definition in the name. Okay, it's a stagnation for a hundred of years. But what are the reasons behind? You have on one side Larry Summers in the US that says, okay, because of a lack of inflation, we are unable to have a sharp decline in the real interest rate that would make it profitable to boost private investment. So because of this zero lower bound in the nominal interest rate plus the lack of inflation, we're trapped. 
we cannot have a boost on demand through a large decline in the real interest rate. So we need something else. And he is, or has been, proposing a sharp increase in public investment in the US, for instance, Summers. Okay? So his idea was, because of the lack of inflation, we must be having a boost on demand that will come from the public side, not the private side, because it will not be coming from the private side. And we have the other story, which relates more to Robert Gordon, who says that your computers have not improved uh, productivity. This is useless. The last innovation that has been good to the well-being of the people is the fact that we can all or should be all having access to water. Okay. Okay. So the fact that we have bathrooms has improved our health, it has therefore improved our productivity. That is the last innovation that was worth it. Okay. He's a bit old, Robert Gordon. When he comes to Paris, he's always amazed by the fact that he can take a taxi with his iPhone. He thinks we cannot do this. We are a very a least developed country, so he's always amazed. But finally, he has his ideas upon innovations. But many others have followed his view and s saying, OK, productivity has been declining. That's an historical trend. When you tell these people that, OK, productivity has been declining because actual GDP has been declining, they say, yes, it's true. And when you ask, but if actual GDP were resuming, what would happen with productivity? They say, I don't know. My guess is that it will be improving. But some argue that it's declining and will be declining forever. If we think or prove that public investment can produce an improvement in private productivity, we should buy it. Okay. There are papers that deal with this issue that show that higher public investment will have an impact not only in the short run via the demand side, but also in the longer run via the supply side. Okay. So we're proposing this. We also consider that that would be nice if we were to, to have this Minister of Finance for the Eurozone, that rather than dealing with the implementation of tough and strict fiscal rules, it will be having some means, or she would be having some means, to fund public investment that would be having transnational effects, like transnational public investment, like reducing the cost of the refugees policies in countries like Italy and Greece in order to have a more coordinated fiscal policy related to public investment. This is what we're proposing in this report. The second reform is dealing with the imbalances. I told you that the misadjustment of the euro area has been declining for years and is now relatively low as regards its level in the, mid, uh, in the end of the 2000s, 2010s, uh, so in 2008. The problem that remains is that the situation in terms of current account imbalances has improved thanks to the fact that countries that were having deficits are now having surpluses, which makes the euro area the biggest exporter in the world. Considering the surplus of the euro area in terms of its current account, which is close to 5%, considering the size of the GDP of the euro area, this means that the euro area is the biggest exporter in the world, before China. Okay. But the problem is, what will happen first if growth resumes? If growth resumes, will this supposedly good news that we are the biggest exporter of the world remain? Will it remain? Or will this trade surplus decline? 
meaning that our growth will also be dampened by this decline in the trade surplus. Of course, in countries like Greece, the improvement in trade accounts, in the current accounts, comes mostly from the reduction in imports rather than the improvement in exports. Okay? With the austerity they have been going through, growth has been dec decreasing substantially. They lost 25% of GDP in five years. Hence, of course, consumption declined, and the consumption of imported products declined. Imports declined. Of course, that meant an improvement in the current account balance. But what will happen after growth resumes in this country, Greece? Certainly, a deterioration in their current account balance, or, except if they have been able to produce something that the rest of the world is willing to buy. Maybe they have not been able to innovate in the situation in which they were. So this is the first uh, Damocles squirt above the head of the euro area. And even if we consider that we are the biggest exporter in the world because of our export performance, not our lack of performance in terms of imports, the decline in imports that we've been seeing, for instance, in, in Greece, if we are this good exporter, what will happen if the euro appreciates? What will happen about our price competitiveness once the euro goes up? And the natural evolution of the euro is to go up. Okay? There are two reasons for that. The first is we have this external surplus. Okay? So there's a sharp demand for euros from those buying our products. And the second reason, forget this, there is no second reason. Okay. Now that I've made my mind, okay, there's no reason. Okay, so we are very dependent on the evolution of the euro on our trade surpluses. So one way of dealing with this trade surplus might, to some extent, might be to some extent to shift the advantages that we think we have with this trade surplus towards the domestic economy. Rather than being willing to be the biggest exporter in the world, we should be thinking about an evolution in prices in the economy that will make consumption, domestic consumption, then private investment resume in our economies. And one way to do so will be to alleviate the strong divergence in terms of unit labor costs between the different member states of the euro area. And on this graph, you can see the evolution of these unit labor costs in nominal terms between Germany, the line that goes up on top, and the evolution, for instance, of Greece in rows that has been declining sharply. That is one indicator of the lack of consumption and investment that this economy is going through and also an indicator of what would be going better if it were going up. That would mean, certainly, that rather than trying to be the biggest exporter of the euro area, Greece, they would face the possibility of improving their own situation through an improvement in prices, an increase in prices and wages, in order to see consumption and investment resume. We have on this graph, have, we have this dark line that gives the evolution of wages that will be consistent with productivity growth and the target of inflation at 2% of the ECB. Okay? We, the, the literature calls this uh, rule the golden rule of wages. Wages, in nominal terms, should go at the same pace as real productivity plus inflation. But rather than taking actual inflation, we consider that we should be taking the inflation that the ECB is being targeted. If inflation, actual inflation is below the target, no problem. We should be having 
wages go as, at the same pace as real productivity plus the target, which will mean that wages would be going faster than actual inflation, making it possible for inflation to achieve its target at 2%. Okay? So we propose that wages are going up a bit in order to reduce the surplus, have a domestic economy going better, and improve the situation of workers, maybe at the expense of those making profits. I think I have five minutes. Yes, five minutes. So I will just make one presentation. It was longer than I, than I thought. The third reform is related to the monetary policy that has been implemented by the ECB for years. You know that in 2015, the ECB has decided upon a very large change in its policies through large purchases of public bonds on financial markets. Okay. So some label it uh, quantitative easing, some label it credit easing. So that's a large relief on financial markets, on public bonds markets, and one way for the ECB of potentially creating money in the economy. Some argue that this policy has not been eff effective. One argument might be if we look at inflation, inflation has not come back to its 2% target, which means that the ECB, although it has a very expansionary monetary policy, is not able to fulfill the target. There are some others like us that argue that this policy has certainly been effective. If we go into the details of the policy, we have been able to see that the situation on public bonds markets has improved in the periphery more than it did in the core. Okay. So if the objective of this policy was to some extent relieve a country like Italy from the higher yields on its sovereign bonds, it was good and effective. Another argument in favor of the effectiveness of the ECB policy is related to the exchange rate. If you were able to look at the exchange rate of the euro vis-à-vis -vis the dollar, you could see that before the policy was implemented, six months before, the euro depreciates much vis-à-vis -vis the euro. Then the policy was implemented, and finally, the euro remained at a relatively low level as regards its history. Okay? So the decline happened before the policy, but it continued until, let's say, six months ago. But during this period, beginning of 2015 and mid-2017, where the euro was fluctuating around a very relatively low level, we were having a euro area which was increasing its current account surplus vis-à-vis -vis the rest of the world. And pressures in favor of the appreciation of the euro were strong at that time. But it did not happen. So if we were able to make a counterfactual exercise, maybe we'll be able to show that part of the reason why the euro did not appreciate is because the ECB has been created, creating the supply of money that the money was looking for. Hence, this period, 2015 to mid-2017, at the moment we thought the quantitative easing would be ending, should have been ending at the end of 2017, this period was a period during which the euro did not appreciate, although there were pressures in favor of appreciation, maybe that's what the ECB's policy has given us. Okay. So time to improve competitiveness. Okay. So our argument is usually unconventional policies by the ECB have been relatively effective. The problem we see is that the way it is being implemented is not uh, optimal. Every month, the ECB 
is by is purchasing relatively large amounts of public bonds, up to 80 billion euros per month. It started at 60, then 80, finally 30 since January. But this is still 30 billion euros of purchases every month. But it does so, the ECB, with a capital key, which means that if you look at the capital key, every month the ECB is buying 25% of German bonds among its 80, 60 or 30 billion euros of purchases. It is buying 20% of Italian bonds. Uh, no, 17.5. Uh, yes, 17.5%. 20% is for France. Okay. Which means that because the ECB doesn't want to share risk and buy more bonds from Italy than from Germany, where the Germans will be saying, OK, you're taking risks that Italy is going bankrupt, is having a default, although you are not given the ability to share risk. So you do this, if you do not buy per share via the capital key, you will share risk. Okay? Our, pos our proposal is to forget this capital key. Say, two options are possible. Maybe these purchases, if we think they have been ex effective so far, should be targeted towards the countries with the largest amounts of debt, namely Italy. Okay? Rather than buying 25% of German bonds every month, they could be buying 22% of German bonds and 22% of Italian bonds, or rather than the 17%. Okay? They could do so in order to make sure that this policy is effectively targeted at lowering sovereign yields on those countries having pressures on their yields. Okay? With the policy that is being implemented, they're creating the scarcity in a safe asset like the German Bund. Okay? They're buying a quarter every month. They should be buying less. Or they should be using this policy and target it towards the countries with the lowest growth. Make some fine tuning with policy and monetary policy. And here again, that will be good news for Italy, which is lagging behind. Okay. So this is, there are no Italians in the group. Okay. No Italian, no, not in your group, in our group. In our group, there are no Italians. So we are paving the way potentially for reforms in favor of Italy, although we are not having a conflict of interest. We think that this policy has been effective. It will prove more effective if it were targeted not towards Germany, that does not require this kind of policy, but towards the countries lagging behind, namely Italy, but why not France? Conclusion. Yes, the situation has been improving, but it seems that some may argue that because the recovery is here, Business as usual is coming back. We are not requiring any reforms. Although our view is that we need some reforms. But these reforms are not at all part of the agenda of the Commission. This is not part of the agenda of Wolfgang Schäuble in his testimony for his last uh, European Council. It's certainly closer to so-called French position Although there are some differences that maybe we can discuss about after the break. Okay, so I stop. Thank you. So first of all, thank you very much for your very insightful presentation and also for the report. Um, we are now going to discuss a bit about the EU in general and its future. So I'll quickly introduce our uh, outline. Uh, since the paper we had two main parts, one about the EU current uh, situation, economic uh, situation, and the other about more the monetary union, we'll try to follow that structure. So we start uh, with a very brief, since most of the things were already said, 
a very brief introduction about the EU current economic situation. Then we go on. Uh, we wanted to extend a bit the discussion to the consequences of this economic situation to the political and to the social sphere. So we talk a bit about our skepticism. Then Ida is going to discuss about the reforms in the European Monetary, Monetary Union, uh, the models for the future of the eurozone, uh, with some little issues, and then we'll have some points for discussions. So, um, as you <laughs> introduced before, we have some positive uh, events going on in the economic sphere, such as most of the countries have now entered into a path of uh, robust growth, and uh, there, re there has been a decrease in uh, growth imbalances. Uh, also, un unemployment has declined, and the inflation is remaining low, even though many countries have difficulties in um, hitting the target of 2%. Uh, anyway, um, some not very uh, optimistic figures about the growth in the future um, have been produced, I is a table that you uh, also showed, uh, and uh, the risk for decrease is uh, always present, especially in some countries. And also another factor, a uh, negative factor, could be the unemployment, which is not evenly distributed, even though in some countries it is uh, still in uh, quite satisfactory levels. In some others, like uh, Italy, Greece, Spain, Portugal, for example, it uh, has reached very um, concerning levels. Um, so, um, this was just part of the problems that Europe is facing now, because many problems concern uh, some recent challenges, such as uh, Britain exit from the uh, Eurozone, uh, the Im immigrant crisis. Uh, last years, more than the last three years, actually, more than 1.5 uh, million uh, people entered in the Eurozone, uh, in the Euro Euro European Union area, and the managing of this crisis uh, till now has not been that uh, effective si since the burden is not evenly distributed, and this brings um, people in some countries which are having the highest burden of uh, ma managing this crisis to, to be very skeptical about the European Union future. And uh, this crisis also brought with, uh, with itself also the risk for, uh, of terrorism and uh, some safety uh, concerns. And all this picture can be uh, actually seen in the, in the light of uh, uh, raising opposition uh, and doubt to, uh, towards the process, process of European integration. So summing up some economic factors that have influenced uh, our skepticism, first of all is the slow economic growth um, and uh, high unemployment. Um, gro growth was not evenly distributed as we, s as we saw. We had Italy's case and this raises uh, the, uh, um, the dissatisfaction in some uh, countries because the European Union itself was constructed to provide more or less unified um, well-being to all the citizens. And unemployment, uh, even though it has been decreasing, um, what is important to be stressed is that it hasn't been ac uh, accompanied with some uh, other qualitative, uh, let's say, improvements, such as job quality, uh, inco income uh, inequality, and uh, poverty reduction. Um, we see error skepticism, especially in uh, uh, in countries that have to deal with the European debt crisis, especially in debtor and uh, creditor countries. In debtor cr uh, countries, our skepticism is mostly due to the adverse, uh, adverse effects on welfare that the economic adjustment programs have and um, the sense of reduced national sovereignty. Uh, in the creditor countries, on the other side, uh, people feel like uh, uh, have this sense of uh, involuntary use of national and private savings to rescue the European uh, EMU partners. Uh, during the last years, especially during the last set of elections in um, most of the uh, European countries, we have seen the empowerment of some radical parties, uh, both from the left wing and from the right wing, 
and uh, all these countries, um, what what they have in uh, parties, what they have in common is their um, raised uh, our skepticism level for different reasons. Obviously, the left is more uh, because of the neoliberal character that, according to them, the Europe. European Union is uh, undertaking, and uh, the right is more about the uh, sovereignty and identity concerns. Uh, this is this is uh, the core periphery divide. We see here clearly that the core countries uh, actually have more GDP per cap, uh, higher GDP per capita compared to the periphery uh, countries, and then this is a graph showing the last survey in. Uh, one of the last surveys in 2016 of uh, Eurobarometer. Um, and as we see, the Euroscepticism in two 2016 uh, was in one of the lowest level uh, during the European Union um, history. Um, other lowest levels were the acute phase from 2011 to 2012, uh, the acute f uh, phase of the, of the crisis. Uh, then in 2015 we had the uh, influence of the immigratory crisis, but uh, now we have this quite low level of uh, Euroscepticism because mostly of the uh, immigration, uh, the, the refugee crisis and uh, the terrorism threat rather than uh, for mere economic economic uh, reasons. Um, so this was like a general picture of uh, this um, political, let's say, uh, view of the Europe today. Uh, but uh, what, what are the possible future scenarios? Uh, many European affairs uh, experts have like tried to construct these scenarios and the four more uh, known ones are First of all, uh, the scenario of uh, muddling through, so the EU would continue to uh, function as it cur currently does, without any significant treaty changes, and uh, for future crises it will find case-by-case -case, um, solutions, to a certain degree common solutions, but that would, wouldn't be uh, quite easy, as we have already um, seen with the previous crisis. And integration and common policies would be difficult to pursue, actually. Uh, the most, uh, let's say, uh, probable scenario is the establishing two speeds. Uh, the EU would become a uh, two-speed entity, it will uh, uh, become an entity of uh, st some strongly integrated group of core countries and then some peripheral countries more free to pick uh, the EU policies uh, they wish to participate in. And this would formalize actually uh, a structure where solidarity will be a bit undermined and um, also frictions between core and periphery countries may happen. Uh, then we have the third scenario, which is a loose or more intergovernmental inter integration, uh, a scenario that is most likely to happen if uh, aerosceptic parties will come into power in most of the EU countries. This would uh, put further integration of, uh, of the uh, European Union on hold, but a looser structure would make it easier um, to for the EU to expand towards the uh, Western Balkans and also Turkey. And then the fourth and last scenario is a tighter, more integrated configuration. It's a scenario where uh, after Brexit and a possible potential Grexit, uh, the smaller EU would uh, be more aligned on the need uh, to integrate political and uh, economic uh, policies. Now, uh, Ida, we go on with uh, the last part. Uh, so uh, this part of uh, our presentation, I uh, will focus on the problems of Eurozone and the suggested reforms uh, to fix those problems. So after the global uh, financial uh, after the global financial crisis, uh, which was followed by the chain of sovereign defaults, uh, including Greece, Portugal and Ireland, um, the questions about uh, sustainability of Eurozone uh, have arisen. So regarding the possible solutions uh, to these problems, uh, there are basically two fundamental views uh, suggested by the most influential and powerful uh, countries in Eurozone, which are uh, Germany and uh, France, who usually decided direction of the policies to be implemented. So uh, what Germany is saying about the uh, 
problems uh, which are arising uh, from is that there is a lack of economic and uh, fiscal policy discipline and there is a weak uh, financial regulation uh, with the dysfunctional sanctioning mechanism which lead to the build-up of private and public debt and uh, to the loss of competitiveness. And also uh, there is no credible mechanism for uh, crisis response regarding bank and sovereign debt the problems that could dominate in moral hazard problems and establish market discipline. Uh, so what they propose is to have more uh, fiscal discipline and stricter financial controls. So w what is required for that is to uh, member states have to uh, have compliance with agreed uh, rules and uh, to have faith in uh, market discipline. And also they uh, allow for debt restructuring but without risk sharing between the member states. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the very enthusiastic president of France, Macron, uh, he is proposing more pro-European policies. Uh, he is uh, basically suggesting to have more flexible uh, European Union and uh, the main idea is that to have a Eurozone common budget uh, to facilitate structural reforms and uh, boost investment and address economic shocks. And this budget should uh, be uh, managed by Eurozone finance, finance minister accountable to the members of Euro, uh, European Parliament and who will deal with um, public goods and as a professor already mentioned, with, uh, for example, with public investment. Uh, so, uh, what is, uh, and also the main feature of the uh, for reforms proposing by, proposed by France is that uh, member states should have, uh, uh, they have to share the risks between the member states. What they have common in these uh, two reforms, um, so uh, both of them, they are talking about the fulfillment of banking union and uh, the fiscal rules have, uh, mainly they have to stay the same and but they are not talking about the uh, role of ECB and uh, also they are suggesting that um, uh, f they are for the more transparent and more democratic uh, decision making. Uh, so the Germany is model is uh, so here's the Maastricht uh, 2.0. It's a more renewed uh, version of Maastricht regime. So it's about the crisis, crisis prevention and crisis management. Uh, I will be very brief on uh, this uh, slide. So basically, there are three pillars of Maastricht regime. Uh, the first is fiscal and economic policy under the uh, national responsibility. Uh, the crisis mechanism is under Euro European responsibility responsibility and crisis mechanism nested between the two. So basically in the fiscal policy part uh, uh it's mostly it's, uh, it's talk about the no bailout clause because of the moral hazard problems because uh, one uh, the taxpayers of one member state has to uh, repay the debt of the other member st uh, state and strengthening of the market discipline and uh, they also they have to comply with the rules of stability and growth pack which is uh, three percent of deficit and sixty um, percent of debt and uh, there is also this establishment. European stability mechanism that can uh, provide uh, debt, debt restructuring and uh, regarding the banking union it's a project aimed at removing uh, the link between troubled banks and sovereigns uh, that has plugged countries like Ireland, Spain and Italy. Uh, so uh, so he here is the uh, models uh, that was um, actually suggested by the finance strategy. Uh, so uh, here basically the first option, the first model is about the, again, uh, the m about the master regime. Uh, basically the um, main feature is that again there has to be no bailout and but in this case uh, the member states they they are sovereign in establishing the fiscal policies but they constrained with some uh, rules as I proposed under the stability and growth pact but and and also the main constraint on fiscal policy uh, is market discipline. So uh, the member state, they have to be guaranteed with effective market discipline. So how can it be done? Uh, it's um, 
in euro area and especially its banks, uh, they have to be ready to absorb the economic cost of uh, potential default. So banks should be less vulnerable uh, to sovereign defaults by maybe portfolio uh, diversification or debt restructuring. Um, regarding the more option two model, so it's basically about the French model again. Uh, what is it saying is that um, because of the sudden market changes, even the countries who are con who were considered uh, uh, solvent, they also can have troubles and uh, engage in uh, so, um, default crisis. Uh, so debt debt crisis, and. Um, Therefore, they are proposing to have joint liability between the member states, but in taxpayers, one member state have to pay uh, the debt of the other. And this is the main feature, actually, the risk sharing. And um, the problem is that there will be constraints on uh, national budgets. And also, to, in order to implement this discipline in Euro level, uh, the democratic legit legitimacy uh, has to be strengthened. And there, of course, there will be no fiscal sovereignty and uh, the member states, they have to comply with the European legislative organ. And for the macro stabilization in this uh, model, is that uh, the first is centralized fiscal capacity, which uh, uh, can be done through the transferring part of national budgets or through coordination of national budgets uh, with fewer degrees of freedom in the definition of national fiscal policy. So, and regarding the first model, it's about the, it's basically about the US model. Um, I think it's um, uh, sh it shares like some features of uh, uh, two previous models. So it's saying that uh, it has to have like no bailout again, and has to comply with. But um, the member states should be sovereign, uh, so in establishing in fiscal policies. But uh, there will be a f common federal budget, and. Um, uh, also, in order to reduce the risk of uh, permanent transfers between the member states, uh, they are um, they can use. Uh, uh, some suggest that uh, unemployment insurance schemes can be useful in macro stabilization. Um, so, regarding the some political issues going on. Uh, when the Macron was elected, uh, and uh, he, when he proposed his agenda regarding the eurozone uh, reforms, uh, basically Germany they were uh, more like skeptical about that because uh, uh, it, the changes, for example, establishing the uh, euro budget, it, uh, in order to do that, the European treaty has to be changed, and it's uh, more likely it's impossible. And uh, in September, when the uh, German uh, government was uh, uh, re-elected, uh, so Macron again uh, proposed his policies, but he had to wait for a long time for the reply of uh, Angela Merkel because she couldn't establish the new government. And recently, when uh, she established the coalition between the Social Democrats, uh, there was a meeting uh, with the French president and they decided to make a coalition between France and uh, Germany. So what Merkel is saying that uh, Germany and France uh, as the leading country countries in the Eurozone, uh, they have to take responsibility to implement some uh, the new reforms. And, but basically, they are not saying about the details. And uh, so it's uh, postponed until the March of this year to have some uh, joint uh, decision about that. Uh, and um, so uh, we had some points for discussion, very short, but basically we wanted to ask your opinion about the, as we mentioned above, the uh, American model of fiscal federal federalism, uh, whether it could be implemented in uh, to Eurozone. And the second question um, about the role of ECB in the reforms to be implemented in your future, I think you more or less already answered to this question. Uh, but maybe you can uh, elaborate more on that or have some more points. So basically that's it. That's it. Thank you very much. No references. Uh, 
Uh, so now maybe you can uh, answer or maybe you have some comments and then we will uh, get some questions from the audience. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So many thanks for your uh, for your comments and uh, the, the presentation, which was uh, to some extent uh, richer than my own presentation. So thank you for giving some uh, content to my presentation. Uh, most importantly, to social issues that I did not report on, uh, for I limited myself to chapters one and three of the report. But the report, uh, I didn't say it, but it's uh, free on the inter internet if you want to have a look. It's uh, very easy to find. And uh, the, it has uh, chapter two related entirely to uh, social inequalities and territorial inequalities across the EU 28. So if you want to have some, some details on that, you can find it even in the report, of course elsewhere, but also in the report. And if I should be making two points about this, uh, th this chapter, this would be that, uh, so we are interested in, uh, in these inequalities, social inequalities, but what we have seen in the data is that convergence between the different regions in the European Union has improved recently. When we were making the first reports, we were able to show that there was a situation before the global financial crisis and after the global financial crisis. Before that, there was some kind of convergence between the poorest regions in the, Euro in the European Union and the wealthiest regions in the Re European Union. Then, after the global financial crisis, there was a break in this relationship and there was a change. There was real divergence coming back. In the most recent data, with growth in the smallest members in terms of their GDP size uh, of the European Union, this divergence has vanished and convergence is back. Okay? And this no, does not mean that everything is okay, but it has improved. The second point is that it, there is a, a graph that I don't have in my, uh, on, my, on my key today, uh, which shows that if you look at the evolution of inequalities before and after tax policies have been implemented, we can show that the social and tax system does improve e equality. Okay? It seems that it reduces inequality in Europe. The countries with the sharpest tax policies or social protection policies are able finally to be effective at trying to dampen and dampening inequalities. Okay, so maybe the, the, the conclusion we are making is that since the overall situation is improving, we maybe do not need the European Union to take care of these discrepancies between the different member states because it has been reduced. What remains at stake is giving the possibility of governments to continue having social protection policies so that they should not be thinking in terms of fiscal austerity then we reduce social spending we continue social sp spending provided it reduces inequality okay so maybe rather than a european policy we require some domestic policies that can be implemented even in the realm of the stability and growth pact and with the current fiscal rules uh, maybe another comment before I uh, come to your question. Uh, when, when you presented the, the, the German and the French view, uh, this, what you presented to, to me, uh, according to what I think we did, but we were not, maybe not clear enough, was the German view, yes, or the Schäuble view. Mark and I have very good friends in Berlin, that do not believe in the Schäuble argument. And maybe some of you, if you were in Berlin, have met one of, a, a good friend of mine who is Achim Truger, uh, Eckhart Hein, uh, with whom I've been working some, some in some, on some of these issues. And so this is not their view, the German view, but let's call it the German view or the Schäuble view. Okay, that's the view that we do not like, uh, understood. And the other view is not the Macron's view, okay? So it's more the IAGS view and all the others that will believe in this view because there are some details that are not part at all of the Macron's agenda to date. 
for instance, on, uh, on public investment. When we do speak about the golden rule of public finance, and Arim has been making many papers last year on this issue, we've been promoting this uh, reform altogether last year. We take it back once again this year, but we believe in this rule. This is not part of the agenda by Macron. Macron is, uh, for, for what I understand of uh, Sorbonne's speech, is believing in the budget for the euro area in order to deal with a crisis. If a crisis happens, if there's a shock, a symmetric or symmetric shock, we should be having a common budget to deal with that. And his view seems that we should be, to some extent, using public investment to dampen the shock, which would mean, rather than cutting public investment during the crisis, we should not cut it, because we would have, been, would have some funds in order to cope with the crisis. But that doesn't mean that when days are good, when the sun is shining, we should be promoting public investment. Okay, his view is that we should not cut public investment during the crisis, but not promoting public investment. The view that Harim and myself are having, and many others that believe in the golden rule of public finance, is we should be having this rule by all weathers, bad and good weathers, okay? because we believe it will be fruitful to, to the economy. And maybe, but maybe I will come to this comment after, there have been some proposals by the Commission in early December that, is, that are being a mix of the German view and the Macron's view. And to some extent, we are close to some proposals with our IAGS for you. Some are very far from what we, we believe in. So I will come thirdly to this point very, very soon because you ask about uh, some kind of US federalism for the EU, and this points to one of the proposals of the Commission. Have you seen the different proposals that they've been making? So they, they, they urge the, the fulfillment of the fiscal rules, so they believe that we should still be having these fiscal rules, so they do not want to change the framework of fiscal rules in the EU, which is very close to the position by Schäuble, who, is, who, is, who was proposing a simplification in the rules. At this stage, we have four to five fiscal rules okay, that must be fulfilled by the member states. So Schäuble wanted just two. The fiscal rule at 3% and returning towards the 60% of GDP for the debt ratio at the 20-year horizon. Okay? It was its position. The Commission is for this, is believing in that, simplification. But it wants, the Commission wants to take back power. Because the fiscal compact, through which one other fiscal rule is that the cyclically adjusted deficit should not be beyond 0.5% of GDP, is not part of a treaty. It's part of an intergovernmental treaty. Okay? So the Commission cannot control for the fulfillment of this rule. So it would like to take back control on this rule, maybe simplify it, but take back control. Okay? So they are very eager at the Commission to take back control and to have the rules fulfilled. And they are in favor of this uni European Monetary Fund, which to some extent was very close to the position by Schäuble, changing the ESM in, into an EMF in order to have some prevention of crisis, but conditional, as you said and, and wrote, on the fact that you first fulfill the requirements of the fiscal rules. Okay? So the position of the Commission is very in favor of Schäuble, but also in favor of this budget capacity, this Eurozone budget, in order to dampen shocks, which this time is very close to Macron, but with, and I come to your question finally, which will be embedded into the EU budget. So the US federalism would be improved in Europe through this capacity for dealing with shocks through this EU budget. So we will be having a stronger budget. 
but that means nothing. A stronger budget, unless the means are changing. But there is no discussion about the means. Okay, so this budget has, to date, three to four functions. So common agricultural policy, which is called the sustainable growth, something like that. It's agricultural policy, but uh, sustainable growth. You have security issues, competitiveness issues, and I guess innovative issues. So four functions with a budget of one percentage point of GNP of the entire European Union. And the Commission is proposing to have to add a fifth function without telling us where the money will come from. And the greatest risk to date is that there will be no penny more. Of course, they will leave. The UK will leave. There will be no euro more in the budget, which will mean that if ever we have this fiscal capacity in the EU budget, there will be some spending that will be cut. Maybe uh, agriculture, depending on political power, maybe innovation, maybe competitiveness. Nobody knows. So the, the proposal by the Commission is going into the direction of a US budget, US style budget, but without the means that this budget has in the US. The biggest budget in the US is the federal budget. The budget of the states in the US are very small in comparison. We have the entire reverse situation. And no one is proposing to go, to go in the direction of a US federalism budget. So my guess is that it will not happen. But my guess is that we will also be having very sharp discussion about the next EU budget. Once we do not speak about what it will be dealing with, but the amount of money we need for it. And if you tell the Germans that we need more money, they will say no. If we, you tell the French that this means that the agriculture policy will have to be renationalized, former presidents in France would have said no. Macron, I don't know. Okay, so uh, my guess is that we will not go in, be going into this, uh, this direction. An issue with this direction in comparison with the US is also the fact that in the US they just have one currency. This is not the case for the European Union. We still have many currencies. Okay. We are having 19 member states sharing the same currency, the euro, and then the seven others, I do not speak about the UK, they want to leave, so they leave, and among these seven other countries, six must have the euro. Uh, six or seven, seven. Uh, we are 27 without the UK, and out of these 27, only one has an opt-out close, okay, Denmark. All the others, they must have the euro. So before we come to some US federal, federal budget, we also need to have all the countries in the European Union have the euro except Denmark, because they don't have uh, the obligation to have it, okay? So this makes it very unlikely that it is something on the agenda in the near future. As for the reforms of the ECB, uh, I committed a paper on, uh, no, it doesn't have sense in English, commettre un papier doesn't mean anything, so I wrote a paper with colleagues uh, on a triple mandate of, uh, the, of the ECB, was, uh, four to five years ago, so maybe we were not the first, but uh, maybe we were, I don't know, by which we argued that it would be very good, very important for the, the European Union to have this single European Central Bank having three different uh, objectives, an inflation objective, an unemployment or growth objective, and a financial stability uh, objective. To date, it seems that this central bank as a dual mandate, but it's more or less a de facto dual mandate, and to date not a de jure dual mandate. So which means that there could be some 
changes in the interpretation of the mandate if and when the ECB changes president or its governing council is changing. So what we were arguing was a deep change in the mandate so that it is written down in a, in a treaty. And we will be favoring a change in the price stability objective by which it will be the council that will be telling what it does mean, price stability. Is it zero inflation, 2% inflation, a range of inflation? Okay. We prefer a range of inflation. I'm among those that consider that inflation targeting is not evil, okay. provided it is used with flexibility. Okay. You use it in order to give some information on the future path of your monetary policy to financial markets. But you may tell them, okay, it's only price stability, or it's a triple mandate, and it's the market that has to understand what your future path of policy will be. But if you are credible enough, you may decrease infl your interest rate, even if inflation is soaring, provided growth is getting down, for instance. No issue. That has happened in countries with under inflation targeting, de jure, in our uh, European Union, we do not have inflation targeting framework de jure. We have a mix of price stability and inflation targeting. Okay? So this will be a first reform. Uh, in, uh, recently, we've been producing also a paper at the OFC, a policy brief on balance sheet policies by uh, central banks in which we were arguing that what the ECB has been doing, what the Fed has been doing, by what major central banks have been doing, moving up the size of their balance sheet and having some uh, portfolio policies could happen not only in bad days, but in good days as well. So we propose uh, that this unconventional policy become conventional, provided we know they are meant as conventional by the policy makers. Okay? They are not exceptional, they are usual policies. Okay? We may help Italy with its debt through monetary policy during a while. That might not be in opposition with its mandate. End of my... Uh, okay, uh, thank you very much. I, uh, I think we can start with the first round of uh, questions. So, Casper, Victoria and Emmanuel. Um, hi, I'm Casper. I'm from the Netherlands. Uh, I was wondering how large do you think the role of uh, non-price competitiveness is in the trade imbalances in the uh, European Union? You, you prepare a paper on that? <laughs> so you need an exact answer or not? not no, no, okay. Thank you. Hi, um, my name is Victoria. I'm from Option B and from Austria. Um, and I have one comment and one question. So the comment is on the, uh, the attribution of uh, quantitative easing resources according to the capital key. Because there's a, a very recent study by um, a rather nasty German economist um, saying that uh, <laughs> the, the European Central Bank is actually currently not adhering to the capital key because to the, the distribution of quantitative easing resources according to the capital key and is actually now buying more um, bonds of southern countries, namely Italy and Spain, uh, than uh, of Germany and no bonds of Balk um, Balkan countries at all. Right, so, with <laughs> um, so, so the European Central Bank has been buying massive amounts of uh, German government debt um, over the, the, the entire quantitative easing period. Um, and and, um, and now, uh, essentially, um, there hardly are any government bonds left for the European Cent Central Bank to buy, so they have to buy southern, uh, <laughs> southern country bonds. And now there's, there are people complaining about this even more. So that's the, that's the comment. Um, and then my question is, um, what difference do you think it would make if the European Central Bank had a flexible inflation target rather than a fixed one at 2%? Thank you. Welcome. Thank you, Professor. My name is um, Emmanuel. I'm from Option A. 
Um, it's evident that um, activities from financial sector also contribute to uh, imbalances and shocks. And um, like the graph you, you showed in, in uh, 2007, it's, uh, we can attribute more of this from the uh, finance sector. So I want to ask, since we also know that each time policymakers make some fiscal uh, policy, the bankers also come forward with uh, financial innovation to bypass the, uh, this uh, fiscal policy. I want to know how the uh, ECB and the, uh, the, uh, the, the EU financial fr fr framework, the plans they have and the, uh, the kind of uh, frameworks they are planning in order to, to this effect. To this effect. Okay, so m my turn to, to answer. So thank you very much for these uh, uh, challenging questions. So I will be very uh, disappointing uh, with the first one, the non-price competitiveness com contribution to imbalances, which I did not prepare myself to, so I have no figure in my mind. So I prefer to tell nothing rather than telling nonsense. Uh, of course, uh, the, the situation uh, is certainly very different from one country to another. The, the amazing thing has certainly been to me to see uh, a country like Germany uh, deciding to deal with price competitiveness, although their non-price competitiveness was certainly one of the, the highest in the world. So they did so in the 2000s to be the biggest exporter in the world and beat China at that time. They were to some extent successful and unsuccessful, so it was very costly to their domestic economy first, of course, because they limited uh, wage increases substantially in the 2000s. Then when price competitiveness improved, considering that they still had these non-price competitiveness, they were hit by the global financial crisis and the sharp decline in world trade, which was one reason why their GDP has declined substantially. But since world trade has resumed, of course, their non-price and price competitiveness have helped them uh, to, to, to recover. This situation of non-price competitiveness being high in Germany is certainly not the same for a country in Portugal, like Portugal. Portugal was uh, largely competing with so-called least developed countries in terms of price competitiveness, price competitiveness. What has happened so far with the crisis and during the crisis or since the crisis has been the sharp improvement in the non-price competitiveness that has made possible for this country to recover relatively fast. So they made reforms that it seems were uh, sufficiently effective at improving the trade balance, not only thanks to price competitiveness, but also non-price competitiveness. I wouldn't say that it's half-half. Surely it's more, non -pri more price competitiveness that was helpful, but non-price competitiveness was helpful as well. When you look at Greece, non-price competitiveness is not there. Okay, so the, the exports have surely not increased so much as imports have declined substantially because of growth. Okay, so different situation between the different member states. So, okay, long answer to say almost nothing. Okay, so sorry. <laughs> uh, I would like to know the name of this uh, nasty uh, German colleague of mine, uh, please. Heinemann. Sorry? Heinemann. Heinemann. A very nasty guy, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> May, may I tell an uh, anecdote uh, uh, about some, uh, some nasty economists coming from Germany? Are there some Germans among you? Yes. So may I tell a story about a nasty German economist? Yes. Yes, I can. Okay. Do you know... Uh, uh, ah. In Sorry. Star Wars. Uh, in Star Wars, there is a nasty guy in the... the, the the, 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 the early Star Wars. Thank you very much. Uh, so do you know, 
Shtok Veda. Now you do, so some of you know about Shtok Veda. So I was asked once in my life to go to the European Parliament to share a session with Jürgen Stock. Jürgen Stock, German economist, had decided to leave the European Central Bank for personal reasons at the worst moment of the so-called sovereign debt crisis in Europe. Okay. So he decided to leave for personal reasons. And the European Parliament asked him for a hearing in order to ask him questions about why he decided to quit. Of course, he didn't tell. Of course. Personal reasons. What we understood afterwards, many years after, is that he was not happy at all with the policy that was starting being implemented by Trichet, which was a more expansionary monetary policy stand in favor of the periphery. So he decided to quit because he was not agreeing with that. This is a point that I think is a relatively good point. Why was he nasty with me, in fact? Uh, because I was no one sharing the floor with him, and because I was telling things that he thought were nuts. Okay. So he made a speech first, of course, because it was Stark Vader, so he spoke before, and he's not my dad. I can tell this. He's not at all my dad, uh, because he wanted to kill me, but for real, in the end. So he was telling nuts, he's nuts, about Fiscal policy should be in good order. Fiscal discipline is key. Market discipline is key. We shouldn't be helping all these countries with large debts and deficit. They should be going bankrupt. They've gone wrong. We do not want to help them. Okay. Okay. And the European Parliament, they were listening. Okay. They were very happy. Then was my turn to speak, and I was saying that according to many uh, papers, and I was not authoring or co-authoring any of them, there was a growing consensus that the fiscal multiplier was positive. This is what I said. Okay. The fiscal multiplier, you know about that? Okay. Make a fiscal expansion, and it has positive real effects. And I was showing some papers with the computation of the fiscal multiplier effect. And this ranged between 0.5 and 3. There was uh, a paper in the US by Mrs. Uh, Romer. She was advising Barack Obama at that time. She made a paper in which she found three as a fiscal multiplier. So one percentage point of public spending more means three percentage more of growth, which is astounding. So if, it, if she were true, let's make fiscal expansion because it will limit public debt in the end because it's self-funding, OK? you will be having tax receipts after that, after that push. And there was this 0.5. And, OK, so I was making a, a plea in favor of fiscal policy. So stop fiscal austerity and even make some fiscal impulses to get us out of the crisis. I guess we were in 2011. Okay. And uh, he said, I need to talk after this guy I do not know, Mr. Nobody was there, so he could, he could talk, but I need to talk now. And he said, this guy is a liar to the audience. He said, what are you talking about? And he said, there is a paper that you mentioned who is a paper by, which is a paper by authors from the ECB. I knew it well. They were from the ECB. They found a fiscal multiplier of 0.5 with John Taylor. There was John Taylor as an author, so he couldn't sign a paper in which it would have been three as a fiscal multiplier, but 0.5 he could, which meant that it was improving, but not to the extent of being self-funding. But he said, this guy is a liar. And I, I was so amazed, I said nothing. I said, no, it's, it's in the data, I look at the paper. But finally, I went to him privately and said, I don't know about the mathematics in Germany, but maybe you will tell me. But in France, 0.5 is positive. Okay? It's not negative 0.5, it's positive. I didn't say it was high, I said it was positive. And finally, there has been a consensus on the fiscal multiplier. So I was very at ease, I knew I was right. Okay? But I was right before he was. Okay? So this was a nasty guy, a very, very nasty guy, because he told the audience I was a liar, and I was not a liar. I had some slides, he had not. So this <laughs> makes me very far from your question, but 
What is amazing with what you were mentioning, young lady, is that uh, we have made a paper, we were asked at the parliament to make a paper on this mm, quantitative easing and this capital key, in which we have taken all the data so far, which result was the ECB has bought 25% of German debt, 20% of French debt, and so on and so forth, according to the rule that the ECB has given itself. This is something I didn't say. This capital key rule is a rule that the ECB has decided to abide by, although no treaty tells them to do this, for a very simple reason. This is an unconventional policy that nobody was thinking it would happen in the Maastricht Treaty, when the Maastricht Treaty was prepared. So it's written nowhere except in the heads of those at the European Central Bank. So they could use another rule if they wanted. They do not want. Okay. Do they abide by this capital key? My answer is yes. Are they unable to do so because there are no longer any German issuances? I don't think so. Okay. And if it can relieve, to some extent, smaller countries, okay, let's buy it. But I don't think it is right. And if it is, it might be on a very short time span. Because what we saw in the data is that for some months, okay, they bought more Portuguese bonds than they should have been doing. But three months after, they bought more, uh, less so than they should have been doing. So on average, it was steady, okay, 25, 20, 20. So this is a non-problem. Okay. But I understand that the, the Germans are very fearful of what happens with the ECB. They are fearful that with this amount of money that the, uh, the, the, the ECB has been creating, we will be having hyperinflation. But when we look at the data, there is no inflation. Okay. And when we look at money, it has not grown. Bank reserves have exploded, but money has not grown. And it is because it has not grown that the ECB is continuing its policy. Because banks are not increasing credit as they should be doing, according to their access to liquidity. Okay? So we are very far from hyperinflation. And that's good news. Okay? Okay. So before we go into hyperinflation, I think that the governor at the ECB will be able to change the policy. Uh, financial, uh, no, flexible inflation targeting. Uh, the question about flexible, what, uh, my, my guess, I will make it short this time. Uh, my guess is that it would have changed the policies before the crisis. At this stage, it would be changing nothing. And what it might be changing might be, oh, growth is resuming, but we don't have inflation. So if growth is resuming, we should be, thinking about having a less expansionary monetary policy. So preferable at this stage not to have flexible inflation targeting. But before the crisis, certainly would have meant lower interest rates earlier. And not a surge of interest rates on June 2008, for instance, when the ECB was the single institution in the world thinking that the crisis was over 2008. Okay? To 2008, June, increase in interest rates at the ECB because of a surge in inflation, because of oil markets. This has not changed the oil market, but has changed the credibility at that time of the monetary policy. As for financial markets and your, your question, we, since the crisis, the global financial crisis, there has been some policies in favor of trying to stabilize banks via this banking union by which there is a single supervisor for the most biggest banks in the European Union. So this is certainly a very good step in favor of achieving bank stability. Okay. So this has happened, so it should to some extent reduce financial market instability. But, and there is a large but, nothing has been done on shadow banking. There are still no regulations on shadow banking, all the activities of banks and non-banks out of the banks. Okay. So which means that finally we have 
had institutions focusing on one major uh, institution, the intermediation uh, institution, but n doing nothing on what was at the very beginning of the crisis in the US, namely shadow banking. So we still have also this Damocles sword over our head because we may be uh, very uh, sensitive to any shock on the shadow banking industry, okay? meaning that financial markets instability might resume very fast. Okay? So there have been steps, but not uh, comprehensive steps, might be my answer. Okay, okay thank you. Uh, let's do the second round of questions. Maria, uh, can we do it from here? Carmen, Ettore, and Maria, and then. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I'm Carmen from Germany. Yes, uh, I know. Just one comment on the non-price competitiveness. Would it be reasonable to assume that uh, countries that produce products of higher sophistication, technically uh, or mechanically, uh, ha have uh, lower price competitiveness than countries with uh, exports of goods? which are less sophisticated, which would somehow uh, relate to the point you just made. I don't know if this uh, would hold. Um, and my question would be uh, to ask you for a scenario. Uh, as, uh, so since the Fed has uh, started raising interest rates, um, how we would find ourselves with an, in, with a, I mean, it, it's going to be partial increases, but uh, however they may look like. Thank you. I'm Ettore, option B from Italy. So my question is on industrial policy. And so uh, more precisely, how could we uh, create more fiscal space to promote uh, coherent industrial policies within the European, the Eurozone? And uh, especially, uh, especially regarding the periphery of the Eurozone and the periphery of the periphery. I'm thinking uh, more specifically regarding the Italian Mezzogiorno that is trapped in a double trap to be a un an underdeveloped area in a former, in a middle income country. Uh, so, well, should we implement fiscal transfers? What's the, fis the political feasibility of fiscal transfers? And if we ca can we manage to, to 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 promote the convergence of the periphery of the periphery? Uh, I'm Maria from Option B, and I would like to know about two different topics. First one is on the European the proposal of the euro bonds. Uh, uh, I don't know if you have come across the proposals by Tom Pele. He proposes a European uh, public finance authority to be created, so then the European Central Bank would be able to purchase the public bonds in the primary market, which is not the case so far with the target two. If you think this would be feasible, and if this, and if feasible, if this would uh, help in any case the situation, the, the convergence of the European countries. And second is the capacity of uh, changing the taxation, so tax reforms, to create both uh, fiscal space, uh, to create, uh, uh, I don't know, a positive fiscal impact as, a, as well as reduce uh, personal income inequality, which has been raising even in countries like France and Germany that uh, had been known for being very equal in the income distribution. And also stop the race to the bottom, a decrease in tax in corporate taxes in the European countries for competitive reasons. Yes. So I have three hours per question. <laughs> Thank you very much. So let's see you all in nine hours. Thank you. So my turn to... <laughs> to reply to your uh, interesting questions. So all the, qu the questions are very excellent questions. The, the six, uh, seven to eight, three people asking questions, very good. Um, so, uh, so about uh, innovative versus uh, less innovative products, uh, the, the contribution, I guess, of non-price competitiveness is of course higher for very uh, highly technological products. 
So I don't think, uh, I don't know if it answers your question. So my guess is that uh, price competitiveness is not as key for uh, uh, innovative products as it is for non-innovative products for the markets are not the same. Uh, you certainly are more in a situation of oligopoly or monopoly with an innovative product than you are with a less innovative product. So th this uh, means, this might explain why I was amazed with the policy of, in Germany uh, in, during the Schroeder's era. Okay, so you have a, not only innovative, but a, a strong economy producing high quality products that certainly has not to uh, resort to rely on price competitiveness unless it wants to take some market shares to the rest of the world. Unfortunately, it did, but only to European countries. So this was uh, a very um, uh, disappointing policy, this G German policy in the 2000s. They, had they taken market shares to, to China, I like the Chinese, but uh, okay, they're very far from me. If you take market shares to Italy, to Spain and France, which we have found in the data, it's a pity because we thought we were part of the same family. So the, 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 the fact is that we have had here uh, a political mistake by the other uh, members of the council at the moment the Germans have decided upon this policy. The mistake has been to not to tell Gerhard Schroeder that his policy was certainly a very good policy. It was so good that we will be implementing the same at the same moment. Okay. Maybe it would have changed something, certainly in Italy, in Spain, and France, because the, the situation of our, of our firms has been very, uh, very dramatic, and the wages have stopped increasing. It has had consequences on consumption, it has had consequences on investment in France, in Italy, in Spain, before the global financial crisis, which was a major shock. So we were not very well prepared to this, uh, to this crisis because of a non-cooperative policy, which was free policy. It was uh, the decision by the Germans, and I think the French were very bad politicians at that time. I don't know who it was, so this is not a partial uh, thinking. Uh, it's always partial, certain, certainly, but uh, partial, huh? uh, partial, pardon, in French. Uh, consequences of the Fed policy might be uh, a good thing for the ECB uh, for the discrepancy between the interest rates across the Atlantic is in favor of, to some extent, depreciating the euro, or it should. Unfortunately, this is not what's happening today, so this is a bit amazing. Like many uh, economic uh, concepts, the Phillips curve, the Hawkins law, we are all searching for an understanding if it's flatter, not flatter. Do we have the good data? Do we understand what's happening? So this is a bit amazing as well, uh, the reaction of the exchange rate uh, considering the change in the Fed policy. But the Fed policy is not that strong. It has been... Uh, expressed, told very early, it's just starting, okay? And the ECB has uh, waited long before it said it would continue. Yes, you want? My question was rather, what, what's your scenario if the ECB is about to raise interest? Ah, sorry, I, I thought... Uh, so the, uh, uh, I would, uh, a nightmare. So there were four scenarios. So the, the, the nightmare scenario is the ECB is uh, changing the orientation of its policy and has a, a restrictive mix, I, th I think we will be in a very a dramatic and tragic situation. Because we, we are having this growth, okay? It's, to some extent, self-sustaining, but not across all the member states. Better so than in the past, but not enough in a country like Italy, for instance. So there will be some elections in Italy in a few, even not months, weeks, month, month. So the discussion about uh, leaving the euro will certainly go, come back. And if you have this change in the monetary stance, this will be a nightmare because that would mean, okay, everything is okay, I raise interest rates, which is uh, not at all the position by Draghi uh, to the extent I understand what he is uh, saying. So if it were to happen, I think it would be uh, dramatic to actual GDP and potential GDP. Okay. But so my, the probability that it happens, at, I think, is very low. 
Okay, so hope so. I, I should be telling again, I really think, but I am not the only one, that this policy by the ECB has been effective. Without it, we wouldn't be sharing the same currency. I don't know if it will be better or worse. My guess is it will be worse, but I don't know, but we would not be having the same currency. So we, if we have a chance to have this currency, we need this ECB. Do we need this currency? That's another question. Okay. When there was these elections in France, there were many people considering that we should be telling the people that if ever we quitted the euro area, that would be a nightmare for France. A f only a few people decided to try to show whether the euro had been fruitful to France or not. not it was not a question of science fiction. What would happen next? What has happened? Okay. I made a paper with a, a young uh, student. He was not a student, student of mine. He's a colleague of mine, Pierre Aldama, where we took statistical data of GDP, inflation, unemployment, etc. Et oh, we were having 25 different data for France before having the euro, after having the euro, and making a distinction between we have the euro before the global financial crisis, we have the euro after the global financial crisis. The best situation for France was after the euro, before the, euro, the global financial crisis. This is not a proof that the euro was fruitful. Okay? But this is some indicator that things had not gone in the wrong direction after we had the euro. Okay? It was not sufficient to, to dampen the crisis, but we were having some improvements in our situation as we got the different uh, indicators, some were social, uh, after have adopting the euro. So my guess is that it will be better off with the euro than without. We, we are a tiny country. Okay? When I make some classes before ch Chinese students, and I tell them the European Union is a large area, they're laughing. Okay? <laughs> How many are you? What is the size? They're laughing. Okay. So if I tell them France is a big country because Louis XIV was our king, okay, they laugh twice. Okay? So, my guess is that we are in a better situation altogether. But we need to change uh, and have a, a change in our governance. Are we able to have an industrial policy? So if there is something on which the European Union is not working that much, it's certainly this issue. I don't think this is for good reasons, but my understanding is that governments they do not want to have an indus a European industrial policy. So they do not want to have some fiscal transfers towards the southern part of Italy because they think, oh no, it's useless without checking really. And uh, at the same time, they don't want to have an industrial policy. There is still this struggle of having one's own domestic industrial policy, not a European one. So they, they the reason might be uh, the, the birth of the European Union. The European Union is based upon the idea that competition will improve our situation. So we do not need something like an industrial policy. We must let competition improve the well-being of the people without sometimes questioning this, uh, this prerequisite. So, this is something that doesn't work, but being sure that industrial policy will be raising, will be used, my guess is that it will not happen. And maybe an example based on macro. You were speaking about using fiscal space for that. Maybe you remembered that two to three years ago, there was an influential paper by Olivier Blanchard, so this uh, former chief economist at the IMF, uh, an important professor in the U.S., now retired uh, in Washington, who was with colleagues of the DSG school, so these different dynamic stochastic general equilibrium model, were asking themselves whether fiscal space should be used by Germany to boost the euro area, or should we let a country like Spain have a fiscal stimulus in order to boost the entire euro area. And their point was, there is no fiscal space in a country like Italy. There is no fiscal space in a country like Spain. 
we should be having a boost on fiscal policy and creating public debt in Germany and making it possible for the ECB to buy German bonds. So this fiscal impulse should happen in this very country, Germany, because they have the fiscal space. They are having a deficit below 3%, they are almost at equilibrium and so on and so forth. The debt has been increasing, but not that much. Okay. But that was amazing, because this country already had a nil output gap. The actual GDP was at the potential. So Mark is looking at me since the beginning, thinking many things like this guy is not, because he's speaking about potential output, as if we were able to compute it. I know we cannot, but even if we take the conservative data of the commission, okay, we can tell, okay, Germany seems to be above its potential without any inflation, okay, paradox, one. But if you make a boost in a country that has already strong growth, what will happen? They will be having inflation? They will lose price competitiveness? Okay, what is their interest in implementing this policy? Okay. Although, whereas if you do it in Spain three years ago, in Italy today, that will be able, to some extent, to boost growth without creating inflation. It will be good first for Italy and then for the euro area. Okay, so your question is certainly a very good question, but it's totally out of the agenda because of arguments like uh, Blanchard, uh, Jesper Linde, and uh, someone else, Erceg, er Erceg uh, from the Fed. Okay, so they prefer to use fiscal space where there is fiscal space, and not for Italy. <laughs> I'm sorry, <laughs> but not even for France. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. We need we need a plan B, but. My guess is there are many plan Bs. One would be scrap the, the euro, start from scratch. I'm afraid, but maybe by nature. Oh, sorry. Uh, but uh, there's also something else, changing the government. I proposed or mentioned some proposals. We have plenty other proposals in mind, and there are many, many in, uh, in the literature. But the, the fact is that those that are most heard are those most related to financial markets and banks. We must admit it. Okay. So I turn back to the question of your, uh, of your friend on, on top, which is uh, most of the proposals are no risk sharing because that will create financial risk. If there is financial risk, yields will increase, the production of capital, the creation of capital will decline, it will be very bad for firms, and it will be very bad for workers. Okay, so make firms' profit increase, it will be good for wages. This is the story that is being told to us. So we need macro stability. Okay, but we didn't achieve macro stability when there was this global financial crisis. So the, the, the situation is very difficult, but we need to gather forces this is what we've done with uh, IHES, and I come to the question on eurobonds by Paley, uh, Paley, 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 Paley. So the the last time I met him, uh, we dr drank a very good bottle of wine, but it was very very late. So my my remembrance of uh, Thomas was that uh, night uh, night was short, and I was with uh, Andrew Watt who also proposed the same kind of, of proposal. So they are willing to have these euro bonds and the ECB will be buying euro bonds. Why not? That could be the European Investment Bank that will be issuing more bonds and the, the ECB will be buying them to improve uh, the Juncker plan for public investment. So I'm aware of these proposals. At this stage, I'm not sure that the Germans, once they have a government, will be willing to have this kind of bond, that would be something that will help share risk. That's the integrationist position, but which has an antagonist position, which is market discipline will help reduce risk. So we still have this opposition. So I'm not uh, very confident in the creation shortly of euro bonds. Okay, my, I'm very, almost very confident, but I shouldn't say so because it's a pessimistic confidence that the a, a kind of status quo will happen. Okay. And ever more so if growth has really resumed. 
We're very happy. Growth is resuming. In the unemployment is declining. Everybody's happy. Let's go again. So until the next crisis. Uh, finally, tax reform. But I don't remember what the question was. Sorry. So they yeah. So on the on tax at the European level, they, there was a, a proposal, a large project uh, with Mario Monti proposing a, a tax on corporate profit at the European Union level, in order to fund the European budget, in order to make sure that there will be sufficient funds in order to have other spending dedicated certainly to, for instance, ecological transition. Okay. The fact is that uh, this report was uh, uh, heard, listened to once, and forgotten completely. So at this stage, what will be striking in the next month will be discussions about a budget capacity, which Macron is proposing, uh, which the Commission is proposing, that maybe the SPD in Germany is proposing, that may finally occur, and that will raise the question that I was mentioning, which is how do we fund it? Do we fund it out of lower spending, or as you raise the issue, out of new taxes? Maybe a new tax would be uh, fruitful. But the problem is that we see uh, our government in France willing to cut taxes on firms. And it would be very paradoxical to have Macron's agreement on increasing taxes on firms at the European level. At the moment, it declines it at the domestic level. So I'm not very confident that this will happen. Although. We, we need it, okay? There is also this uh, willingness by Le Maire, the, the Minister of Finance in France, who is speaking German fluently, so he's very happy to speak with his German colleagues, once he has one, uh, to, uh, about uh, taxing the GAFA, okay? But, uh, okay, this is uh, popular to tell the people. How to do this is less easy than, than, than speaking. So we have... My point, maybe concluding point, is that if you look at the different treaties, we have everything we require. Now we need action. We need to have the, the deeds match, match the words. We have uh, policies for everything, uh, in improving equality between men and women. It is written down in the Treaty of Rome. So we do not have to make a change in the legislation. It is here. We need to use it. Okay? We are supposed to have convergence in real terms between the member states of the euro area. So let's do it. We're supposed to have macro stability. Let's do it at any moment, even during a crisis. So we need an instrument to cope with a crisis. So maybe we will be having it. Okay? So everything is in the treaty, so let's apply it. Okay. Yes? Yeah, it's uh, up to you, and uh, I still have uh, nine hours to prepare my answers to the different topics uh, on which I give just a summary. Yes. Here, yes. Uh, Cristiano uh, from PhD, Paris 13th. Uh, just uh, 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 an add-on on the comments on the question on the euro bonds. Uh, I would like to take your take on the proposal of the safe bonds that they want to create the create a European safe asset by the securitization of trenches that have been proposed by Bruno May and others. And if not, they, they, they argue that it would dim diminish the, the risk sharing and then at the same time uh, increase the, the, uh, an European, create an European safe asset that would, be, would, would improve the, the fiscal capacity 
But wouldn't it be, be bringing additional issues to financial stability once there is uh, a securitized instrument that is 70% of, uh, let's say, a senior part, and then the 30%, which is the junior part, that it's still allowed to for losses. And uh, if, if, it, if, if it was not the case, it, it would be better, uh, uh, let's say, the old proposal of the, the euro bonds, but not for past uh, mutualizing past debt, but, but for new debt and uh, with the purpose of uh, joint investment. So that's a tricky question from a PhD student. Yes? Yes. yes. So, uh, so I'm aware of the proposal of Bruno Meyer. Uh, I shouldn't say so, so I will hide the mic. Sometimes I do not understand a word by Bruno Meyer since it's very complicated. Uh, it's a highly financialized. It's okay. End of uh, <laughs> the cut on what I'm saying. Uh, et je, um, what would I say? If we were sure that, uh, let's say, the European Monetary Fund is being created with a preventive crisis instrument with a change in the yield and the, the risk attributed to domestic bonds by banks as part of the regulation of banks. And at this moment, it happens that there exists a safer set. Maybe I understand that it can work, okay? Because we have this kind of safer set, meaning that no country is facing an advantage at the, the expense of the others, okay? The safer set is for everybody according to your securitization uh, instrument, and it works. The risk I see is that we might be having a European monetary fund and a change, potential change in the regulation of banks through which the risk attributed to, let's say, Spanish uh, sovereign bonds is higher than German bonds, meaning that we will create a safe asset which will be the German bond at the expense of all the other member states. And if we do so with this timing, without having already the safe asset for everybody, we will create instability financially in the European Union, which might be very bad news. So I'm very afraid of the timing of the proposal. So my guess is that uh, Bruno Meyer and the other colleagues have the good optimal timing in mind. But after the timing of the experts, there will be the timing of the policymakers and the politicians, which we know are very different. And there's a risk that we create a new risk and a financial risk and discrepancies between, let's say, Spain, France, uh, Italy, and Germany, Austria, Finland, which is the very reason for this policy, limiting this discrepancy between these member states and having back some cross-border capital flows. The risk is that we don't have them. Okay? So the cure might be worse than the disease, if I may say. So I'm afraid of that because of different timings. But except the fact that I do not understand all the details of the proposal because it's highly technical, it seems good but it might be badly implemented, I'm afraid. And it's very complicated. It's more and more complicated. It's for people from the financial uh, side. Only those working on the financial markets are able to understand what's happening. Although sometimes we would be willing to understand the different rules that are being implemented as citizens. Okay? That doesn't mean they must be simplistic, but to some extent, simple enough to be understood by the people. And with this safer set, I don't think they will, we will all understand. I won't. Sorry. Uh, OK, so if no more questions, I think we can stop yes, here. Thank you very much, <laughs> thank you very much Professor, we'll for your contri contribution to this course. And thank you all for your questions and attention. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you.